Okay, hello everybody. My name is Keshav Deshpande. I'm one of the trauma surgeons um, at Grant Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, um, as part of the Ohio Health uh, System. And uh, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, the management of major bleeding and coagulopathy following uh, trauma. I want to make sure you guys know there's no disclosures. And as far as what I hope you all can take away from this talk is um, what are the derangements that occur um, in your body after crystalloid administration in a patient who's exsanguinating? Uh, and to demonstrate what is the appropriate use of blood products um, in someone who's in major hemorrhage. Um, we have uh, many protocols throughout our trauma program, and one of them is massive transfusion. And there's a lot of challenges about which is the right patient to, to start that on. So I hope to touch base on that. And then kind of the, the real important part of this talk is gonna be about viscoelastic testing, otherwise known as TEG or ROTEM. And uh, just to kind of touch base on how that actually works and then what to do with the results of um, that viscoelastic testing. And at the end, we'll just kind of touch base on what it means to monitor the performance um, of a massive transfusion plan. So as you all probably all are aware, is that uh, severe trauma is a major global public health issue. Uh, there's roughly 5.8 million people annually worldwide that die from major trauma. Um, we see in our urban settings that there's increased traffic accidents. In our rural settings, we're seeing increased traffic accidents. And throughout the entire country, we're seeing an increase in suicide and homicides. One of the newer phenomena that we're having, having to deal with in a lot of our urban uh, cities is mass casualties and how to how to triage and manage that, especially when it comes to hemorrhage. Um, and as something that you probably all already know too, is that uncontrolled traumatic bleeding is the leading cause of preventable death. So when we talk about bleeding, um, I really wanna boil it down to really two different forms of bleeding. There's the surgical aspect of bleeding, and then there's the medical aspect of bleeding. And so when it comes to your resuscitation, um, you have to be able to identify both. And the surgical aspect of bleeding is actually rather easy. You just find the bleeding blood vessel and you tie it off or you clip it or you sew it back together um, and you hope that that fixes it. The medical bleeding part of it is a lot more, is a lot more challenging uh, to deal with. And so this schematic, uh, which was taken out of Europe, uh, really does a great job of kind of pointing out the different factors uh, that are involved in major hemorrhage. And it all starts even before the trauma even happens to the patient. It has a lot to do with their pre-existing conditions, which include their age, genetics, comorbidities, and even the pre-injury medications that might make them more apt to be bleeding. Then comes the actual incident, the trauma. And what actually happens is you get a lot of tissue damage and then the actual hemorrhage to major vessels. That puts you in this situation of being in shock. And shock doesn't just mean low blood pressure, it really has to do with all of these different eight factors. So there's hypoperfusion, sympathoadrenal activation, glycocalyx shedding, endogenous heparinization, which is released from those blood vessels that are damaged and the tissue damage, uh, local inflammation just from all the tissue damage, platelet activation and major dysfunction, what ends up happening is you actually reduce uh, the uh, clotting factor activity uh, in your bloodstream. And eventually your clotting factors get so used up that you're in a state of hyperfibrinolysis. When you get into that stage through that systemic um, endotheliopathy, that's when you go into that, that mode down here that we talk about uh, traumatic coagulopathy. And that is a really tough situation to get out of. Once you head into that path of traumatic coagulopathy, there's really a bunch of different factors that really help you decide whether you're gonna be able to get out of that situation or your situation is gonna get worse. And the two major factors are the, the factors that are associated with the trauma itself, and then the things that you as a provider are doing for your patient. And that's really where the major uh, impact on resuscitation comes into play. Because the, the factors associated with your resuscitation are, you know, you're giving volume, you're giving fluid, and you're diluting all your coagulation factors. You're giving fluid that may be at best room temperature, and your body's not at room temperature, so you're, you're inducing hypothermia. And all of that put together, you're gonna go into this acidosis. And so if you've already recognized, that's the three things that are the triad of death. 
And so it's, it's, it's us, the providers that are actually putting them into that, um, that triad. So the, the, from here on, we're going to talk about how you can get yourself out of that triad. So that brings us to how did modern resuscitation actually come about? And um, at the University of Cincinnati did a really good study that kind of looked at um, a, a rat model or a mouse model. I can't remember which one, but these are the images of some lungs of somewhat of, of a uh, animal model that was exsanguinating and then resuscitated. And so what, what was noticed is that neutrophil activation following hemorrhage was the predominant factor causing mortality in these uh, animals. And so what they did, they had three different models. You can see three different pictures here. Picture number, picture letter A is a sham that received no resuscitation, no hemorrhage, and this is what normal looks like. Image letter C was a, an animal model that was resuscitated with lactated ringers. And you can see all of this purple in, in the bottom picture that is uh, identifying the increased activation of neutrophils and the inflammatory response that you can see. And letter B is what was resuscitated with whole blood. And so based on these findings, what you can see is that the inflammatory process is not really caused by the shock itself. Now you're gonna have an inflammatory process from trauma, but, but not by the shock. And it's actually because of the, the endogenous or the exogenous uh, volume that we're giving them, the lactated ringers. And so you see when you have all of this inflammatory response just in your lungs, you can imagine what's happening to the rest of your body. So what I would like to point out here is, is that crystalloid is, can be very dangerous if used um, too much in a, in a uh, patient. When you look at what we've learned from combat resuscitation from all of the military overseas, we're seeing that you know one of the things that we're not using nearly as often is oral hydration. People get resuscitated rather quickly with um, uh, oral hydration. We've, we've shown that aggressive resuscitation with crystalloids has not been beneficial to the civilian victims after penetrating trauma. That's where that common uh, uh, moniker comes of don't pop the clot. Moderate res uh, resuscitation in the animal models um, of uncontrolled hemorrhage offers you the best possible outcome. So you're trying to really limit the number of crystalloid uh, boluses you're giving. If you notice in this picture of normal saline here, it's, it's written really small, but it's on every single bag of saline. So I urge you to look at uh, some of the stuff you guys uh, are giving. You can see right here, the pH is listed at 5.5. So when you think about it, you're giving a rather acidic um, uh, resuscitation to your patient who's already acidotic. So uh, again, just another point of why crystalloid resuscitation can often be dangerous. One of the benefits though of different colloids or hypertonic saline is that you have a lot of bang for your buck. It's a small package that you can carry. And so uh, when you talk about combat resuscitation, military medics and corpsmen, they don't have a lot of room to carry everything. So it really works out um, as far as uh, size and travel. That brings us to blood and why blood is so important to resuscitation. So you think about it, you have your, your serum blood, you're talking about having uh, hemoglobin or red cells, you're having clotting factors in your plasma, and you're having uh, further uh, platelet aggregation helping you form clot uh, as the major components of, of your blood. And when you talk about blood that's, that we give in, in those three different components, um, they work really well. However, if you think about it, packed red blood cells are different from whole blood uh, because what you're doing is you're taking them, you're centrifuging it out, washing it, cleaning it, filtering it, and, and then giving it back to the patient. And so what you're seeing is you're missing out, uh, even if you're giving those three components, you're missing out on quite a bit of clotting factors, glucose, hormones, and cytokines that actually have a really important interplay in reducing your coagulopathy. That brought up whole blood, and we'll get into this a little bit later in our talk, but whole blood is, uh, is exactly that. It's whole blood, it's, it's taken fresh, and it has all of these different factors in it. So when you resuscitate your patient, you're giving them exactly what they've lost, every single piece and component of their blood. When we talk about damage control resuscitation, there's really four major tenets to how you do this. 
importantly is tissue oxygenation. And how do you do that? Um, by maintaining a systolic blood pressure somewhere between 80 and 90, if it's possible. You don't wanna get much more hypertensive than that because again, you might be popping any clots that might uh, be saving that patient's life. The tricky part is when you have someone with a traumatic brain injury and you wanna to try to do your best to keep their MAP over 80 and help perfuse that brain or spinal cord um, if those are the areas that are injured. When we talk about volume, we really wanna go with the restrictive strategy. We wanna make sure their hemoglobins, we're not transfusing them so much that they're getting hemoglobins of 14, 15. And we'll talk a little bit later about the dangers of over-resuscitation. Um, nowadays, vasopressors as an adjunct is, a, is an okay thing to do. Um, vasopressin has been showing uh, a lot of promise uh, as far as vasoconstricting your vessels, allowing you more time to stop surgical bleeding. When we talk about fluids, I hope I've made this point uh, here very clear that um, normal saline, lactated ringers, and crystalloid in, in general is really not great for your patient. So you really want to limit the amount that you're giving. Restrict colloids too, because colloids aren't necessarily uh, going to be beneficial, such as albumin. And probably the most important feature of damage control resuscitation is temperature control. You, you got to do anything you possibly can to reduce the loss of any kind of heat your patient has. As you get hypothermic, it doesn't matter how much you're fixing their coagulopathy, you will not be able to um, get out of that situation. Again, like we talked about, early use of blood products such as red blood cells or plasma will actually, if, if you give it early, will reduce the total amount that you'll give by almost a quarter. The incidence of ARDS decreases nearly from 25% of ICU admissions down to 9%, just if you do things early. When you look at your patient and you're starting to get all of their labs back, and, and this, this kind of happens when you're back in the trauma bay, um, but you start noticing that they have a low hemoglobin. That's, that's important. A lot of times we talk about don't really judge your, uh, um, your uh, significant amount of bleeding by their hemoglobin, but a normal hemoglobin doesn't really tell you much. A low hemoglobin, on the other hand, does tell you that they've been bleeding for a long time. When you get an arterial or a venous blood gas and you look at their serum lactate or base deficit, it's a very sensitive test to, to identify just the extent of shock that they're in because the base deficit is a really great value to look at what is their estimate of, of global tissue acidosis and how much anaerobic glycolysis is going on. And so uh, when you use those resuscitation markers, that's how you know how just much you need to be resuscitating. So let's talk a little bit more about um, whole blood because it's really uh, one of the most innovative things we've done in trauma. Now it's not a new concept at all, but it's catching a lot more um, research and, and um, uh, investigation because of how well it's worked for our military um, uh, medics. When you look at warm blood, it's, it's exactly what you're losing. Warm, fresh, whole blood. That's what they're using in the military. So they have uh, a, what's called a walking blood bank, and they're able to take people who have compatible blood types and, and extract as much blood as they need and give it to the um, soldier who is, who is bleeding. Well, we can't quite get that right in the civilian population because we can't have a walking blood bank. But what we can do is have cold and stored whole blood. So there's a kind of a big difference when you talk about the two different forms of whole blood. And we're just starting to uh, go into big endeavors about figuring out how that's really working. So we talked a little bit earlier about how I, how I thought a massive transfusion plan is really important. And this is just an example of what we do at our center for starting a massive transfusion and, and what kind of things we're looking at. So why is having something like this, an algorithmic protocol, really, really important. So it's designed to be able to be a logical communication system between your hospital's blood bank, where the patient's at, and the empirical use of a lot of blood products. Implementing an MTP has been shown throughout multiple studies that it improves survival in trauma patients. And MTP, it, it's an unplanned and requires a lot of processing of a large amount of blood products rapidly for a sustained period of time. 
And there's a significant amount of pre-planning and coordination that has to happen between multiple locations, including not just the blood bank, but the ER or the emergency room uh, or operating room, the ICU, all these different places. And the part about resuscitation is you, you never know when this is going to happen. And so having a plan in place for this unplanned event is just a, a good idea. And again, it's been shown multiple times in different um, studies that it has improved survival. So how do we really decide if our patient is going to be an appropriate person for massive transfusion? Because massive transfusion is, is, a, is a lot of laborious work for everybody involved, and you don't want to be wasting blood products. So there is something that the American College of Surgeons um, advocates. It's called the ABC score. And what we look at in the pre-hospital setting especially is do they have a pulse greater than 120? A systolic blood pressure of less than 90, a positive fast exam that's done in the trauma bay, or if they have a penetrating torso injury. And if you have just two of these four, um, the likeliness of them needing a massive transfusion is very, very high. And so this ABC score does a great job of identifying, or it's a very sensitive score, so it'll identify definitely over 90% of the people that need massive transfusion, um, but it'll also catch a lot of people that might not need it. And so you might be overactivating your massive transfusion protocol, but that's okay because the real important part is that you are catching the people that do need it. Again, here's another example of, of the massive transfusion protocol at our institution. And if you notice, there's really two loops you can really be a part of. And so um, you're in this, in this red loop which is our uncontrolled surgical bleeding or a hemodynamically unstable patient. And you're just going based off of a ratio-based uh, component transfusion or whole blood if it's available to you. And that you don't really think too hard. You just keep giving that blood product over and over and over again. And what happens is when you get that surgical bleeding or they're starting to get more hemodynamically stable, we can transition to a more of a goal-directed blood transfusion. And, um, what that does is it, it kind of helps us give the patient exactly what they need when they need it. And this kind of goes into that viscoelastic testing that we're going to get into next. This is just another example of what we use to record um, our blood products so that we can keep track and monitor data and our performance. So what is TEG? TEG is um, something that was not a very common thing in trauma uh, just a few years ago. And so when I first started making PowerPoints about this, I um, just wanted to find some information and some pictures and things like that. So I typed in tag into Google. And the first thing that came up was um, tag is a sheep in its second year. So clearly it wasn't a very popular thing at, at the time. The second thing that showed up was the federal credit union. So it really, really, really wasn't a very popular concept at, at the time when I uh, was really trying to implement this in our institution. Third and finally, that, that, that's when the thromboelastography uh, really showed up. But just like any good PowerPoint, we wanted to have uh, good pictures. And so just like most of you all probably do, you click images in Google and try to find cool pictures. And the first picture I found was a board game from uh, some Latin American country. And I'd love to figure out how to play this game. It looks very interesting. Um, but what we use it for here in trauma and in medicine uh, is really about bleeding and how to fix bleeding. So TEG uh, and other viscoelastic uh, methods have become very, very useful. And the reason why is because it gives us a tailored transfusion strategy to limit over transfusion and give the patient exactly what they need at the time that they, they need it. So when we look at TEG, it's a graph that, that comes up. And this is, this is a, a rough model of what that graph is supposed to look like. And now I don't want you guys to memorize every little piece of this diagram, but what I want to point out is that there's really two halves of this graph that are worth looking at. First and foremost, you're looking at clot formation. So how quickly is clot happening? How quickly is it pro propagating? And how strong is it going to be? That's all the pieces, parts of the clot formation. And just like all clot, it starts to degrade after some time. So that's the fibrinolysis or clot breakdown uh, component of this graph. And when you look at the clot formation, we look at really two to three, two, two main parts is that enzymatic reaction of how long does it take for a clot to even start forming? And then when a clot does start to form right here, how quickly does it propagate and become strong? 
And then when it reaches its maximum amplitude here, that's how you know that, that it, it has gotten to its most strength that it's going to get. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. I'll show you a video of just how this is formed. So it'll make a lot more sense. But any good presentation always has to have the picture of a clotting cascade. This is how in medical school, you always have to memorize this chart of figuring out how a clot actually forms. You have two different pathways, an intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. This is the extrinsic pathway is tissue damage and intrinsic pathway is uh, contact activation because of your blood vessels uh, having some damage. You have all these different factors that go down and eventually make a clot and then eventually your clot breaks down. Now, this is a very rudimentary um, concept um, of how a clot forms. How it really forms is probably something more like this. And so there's a lot of interaction between different cytokines and enzymes that will help promote a clot to form and then finally break down. And so there's no possible way that um, you could measure every single one of these little factors and come up with a plan for what your patient needs in a timely fashion. And so that's why the viscoelastic testing is so important because it doesn't measure any one protein. It, it measures exactly what the blood is doing at that very moment, and it turns the results around very, very quickly. So here's a video of just how that works. So you guys remember the graph that um, I displayed a few slides ago, and this is gonna be how that uh, graph is actually formed. So it starts with um, this, this cup here, and it's gonna, we're gonna fill it with blood, and then we're gonna let that cup rotate. What you see coming down here is a torsion pin, and that torsion pin is gonna sit in that blood, and it's going to plot itself along a graph. As that blood starts to clot, that torsion pin is gonna start to rotate as well. And you can see the graph starting to show you how quickly that clot is starting to develop strength. As it reaches its maximum strength, you'll see the graph kind of tapering off. And now you know you're at the strongest you're possibly going to get. If we fast forward a little bit, you'll see that the strength is starting to get lost after some time. And that's the second half of that graph, that lysis part of the graph. So when we go into the actual parameters next, I'll kind of show you what to look for when, when you get there. But I'd like to kind of talk about why TEG works in a trauma patient. So TEG was, uh, and, and viscoelastic testing really had its roots in um, cardiothoracic surgery and transplant surgery. Um, and what back then, when it, when it first came out in the 1960s, it, it really took a long time uh, for you to get those parameters and see what's happening. So it didn't really make a lot of sense uh, to use in a trauma situation, but now that technology is advanced, we have different reagents to um, make the blood uh, clot faster uh, that, and in the same way that it would uh, physiologically, it gives us those parameters a lot more quickly. And what it does is it differentiates between the different etiologies of the coagulopathy. So whether a patient is deficient in plasma, or cryoprecipitate, or platelets, or um, even TXA. And so th this data, as it comes back, it comes back faster than it would for your classic coagulation assays, such as INR, or PTT, or fibrinogen. It really helps us identify hyperfibrinolysis, which uh, TXA, or aminocapric acid, would be very helpful for. It also gives us some idea if they're on a, a novel uh, or a newer anticoagulant. Uh, for antiplatelets such as aspirin or Plavix, um, there is a, an extra uh, uh, component such as it's called platelet mapping that you would need to do because the, the tag alone uh, won't give you a great idea of um, uh, platelet function. So if you're in the trauma bay or you're in the hospital, the, the type of tubes you would need is a citrated tube uh, that would kind of help with all your, your clotting studies. So it's the same tube that you would get for INRs and uh, so forth. So we're back to that graph and kind of our, um, our resuscitation strategy down here at the bottom. So like, like we were saying before, that first piece of the graph shows you just how quickly that clot is even starting to form. If that clot is taking more than 128 seconds to form, chances are they'll benefit from add, having some plasma. As that clot, clot starts to form and it, it is not rising fast enough, 
at an angle less than 60 degrees, that's suggesting that we're not polymerizing that clot very well. So you can either give more plasma or you can start giving some cryoprecipitate and that would really help. Once that graph gets to its maximum amplitude, that maximum strength, what really drives that feature is your, your how, how well your platelets are working. So if your uh, platelet strength is less than 55, you wanna be, give, or your maximum amplitude is less than 55, you wanna be dosing platelets. As that clot starts to break down and you're in the, in the fibrinolysis stage of your, of your TEG, you wanna see what happens at about a half an hour. After a half an hour, you wanna see how strong it was, how strong it is compared to how strong it was initially. If your lysis, if you're breaking down clot more than 3%, this is where TXA comes into play. And it really, really helps. The purpose of TXA is to prevent clots from breaking down. And so this is where it really has its use. If you give TXA to someone who's not breaking clot down, you could potentially put them the other way and cause them to be um, uh, hypercoagulable. And it could potentially be dangerous. These are uh, some of the clots, uh, or sorry, some of the, uh, the um, graphs of your thromboelastography that um, uh, I think are worthwhile to remember. So this top one is just is normal. This next one down, you see a prolonged ACT or R time. This is someone who could benefit from some plasma. This next one down further has a normal ACT time, but is maximum amplitude is very, very low or narrow. So they would probably benefit from some platelet administration. And then you see here, um, this is, this is a, a plat pattern called the uh, diamond of death. And if you see this, the chances are you're in a very, very strict um, hyper, uh, fibrinolysis. And that person probably needs everything, including TXA. Uh, if you find this hard to memorize, which I'm sure you do, because uh, I do, um, you can always remember it by uh, some kind of alcohol drink. So if you have a brandy tumbler, uh, everything's pretty normal. If you have a pretty long stemmed wine glass, plasma. I never knew what this meant until uh, after I gave this lecture before. I didn't realize people drank through test tubes, but I guess people do anything nowadays. Uh, but this is where you want to give platelets. Upside down martini glass, TXA. So uh, if, if you are interested in thromboelastography, these are probably the most important uh, patterns to recognize. So what happens when you over transfuse? Um, you, you worsen their coagulopathy if, if you don't transfuse quick enough. If you over transfuse different products using TXA, for example, you can have thrombotic complications. If you over transfuse, you're gonna set off a very inflammatory um, uh, reaction in your lungs and you might go into ARDS. TACO stands for um, circulatory overload related to transfusions. And so you could be putting your heart into uh, volume overload and you would have decomposition. Trolley is very similar, transfusion-related um, lung injury, um, and potentially even death due to long-term complications of over-resuscitation, such as a decreased immune response um, leading to pneumonias or various infections. When you do have massive transfusion, one of the things that you have to be uh, mindful of is your uh, performance indicators. You don't wanna be wasting blood and you wanna make sure your plan is functioning um, as well as you need it to. So one of the things that we um, try to identify is how long from the time we activate our MTP do we actually get the first red blood cells uh, to the patient's bedside. And the same thing for plasma. We want to make sure we have enough red blood cells on hand that even if we're transfusing really fast, we're not falling short and don't have enough blood products to give our patient. And the same is true for plasma and even more so for plasma because plasma is generally kept frozen. And so we have to thaw plasma or keep plasma ready on hand. Um, <clears throat> and that's exactly how our institution does it is we have uh, several units of plasma ready to go at any moment. Um, and once those uh, units of plasma are depleted, we're, we've already started thawing the next batch ready to go. You always wanna make sure that you're sticking to a predetermined ratio. It's been shown over and over that having a predetermined ratio um, when you are in that surgical bleeding or hemodynamic instability, instability bleeding, um, where you are just going um, mindlessly with transfusing, you want to make sure that you're sticking to some ratio, whether it's one to one to one or two to one to one. 
either one. Um, you want to know when you want to keep that communication line really clear between your blood bank. You want to make sure that once you're done with your massive transfusion that either all the blood products are packaged appropriately and sent back uh, within within an hour uh, as to not waste those blood products because those blood products can be expensive and someone did actually donate those blood products so we don't want those to go to waste. Those are the major things I wanted to talk to you guys about today. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. That's my email on the screen, keshav.dishpande at ohiohealth.com. Uh, and if you have anything else, um, I would be more than happy to have a discussion. Thank you very much.